Hey, a pleasant good day, everyone. Welcome into the Sports Fanatic News NBA Team Preview. I am Joe Boric, of course, joined by the wonderful Andrew Santangela. How are you doing today? I'm doing uh, well. Uh, I feel like it's been a little while for us and for myself on some of these and finally getting back at it after a long semester and everything and a crazy week. But I'm back better than ever and uh, excited to get back on here. Yeah. Um, yeah, this is our NBA team previews edition where you might get confused if you look at the wall behind uh, Andrew right now, but uh, <laughs> this is our NBA team's preview for the Philadelphia 76ers. Um, that's definitely a wall you should use in every future Flyers video we do before you uh, hey. leave home. But hey, It feels nice to have stuff behind me, actually, instead of a blank wall in a dorm room. I'm home and, and actually can have things on the wall and... You know, <laughs> yeah, just, no, that is feels good. helpful. <laughs> but uh, we'll start with what actually came first in chronological order of the season, uh, which was the draft. Um, what did you think of us picking up uh, Tyrese Maxey, who, of course, was out of Kentucky in the first round, and the fact that he also fell to us uh, at our pick? Yeah, I think you used a great word, fell. Um, I, when I was you know, me being the sports sports guy I am, you know, and I'm previewing for the draft and filling out guys that I, I want the Sixers to target and possibly draft. You know, I, I left them off my piece of paper because, I, I mean, I, I think you would agree and a lot of ex- experts would agree. Uh, we wouldn't expect him to be there at the Sixers pick. I mean, really. Like, I would have thought he would have been gone by then. But instead, he fell, and I felt like at that point when he fell to us, it was almost a, a layup pick and a fantastic pick just because – Again, a guy, when he falls there, I think he's projected to go around 14, 15, and he falls to you at 21. You got to take that. Even though there's guys I thought were, quote-unquote, better fits for the Sixers. Um, no, I thought uh, Maxi was a tremendous pick there. Again, kind of had a light pick once it fell to us. And, uh, again, Kentucky's got good history of having successful players, and I expect nothing else, nothing else from him, especially the way he played in preseason. So I'm really excited the way he, he looked and the way he's going to get at it to start this season uh, starting Wednesday uh, evening. Yeah, yeah, I definitely think Maxi was a fantastic pickup. I think it was a pickup. It might actually end up being someone we need, though, because he's a more athletic on both ends of the court, potentially, version of Thibel, where he already has more offense in his game, has less defense from the get-go, but he's good. He's a good defender, and his, in terms of his like basketball plus minus numbers, they'll probably still be better than Matisse because he has more offensive input from the get go. In in my opinion, ability where I know they were talking about that on Sixers talk as well, where Thibault has kind of been put into an unfortunate situation um, right now with the drafting of Tyrese yeah. Maxey because. Milton's emerged even more and looks very comfortable in his own shoes uh, with the best of his ability coming into this year in the preseason. He just looks like when he gets the ball, he seems confident. Last year, that would be questioned at times. So how do you think the drafting of Maxi and the emergence of Milton actually affects someone like Thibel? Because right now, I think he's probably too down on the guard share of guys that are going to come in first off the bench because Maxi, with how he played, and performed in camp, it sounds like, might even be first up before they put Matisse in, potentially. Yeah, I think you hit it spot on. Um, and listen, it stinks to say after, you know, fan favor he quickly grew into with all the social media interactions he has to him actually playing hard and everything, and like you said, his defensive ability. But, I mean, I think you saw in the preseason games, too. I, I mean, I think Thibault's playing time. Uh, he's in trouble. I think rotationally he's in trouble too. Um, and, and it's crazy to say because even with the other moves we've made, which we'll obviously dive into, you're sitting here saying, okay, well, you might want to let Curry or Green come off the bench, so you you might be starting Thibel. But to your, to your point about the draft and then the emergence of these other guys, now you're looking at instead of starting Thibel for defensive purposes, how much time is he even going to play is the question. I, I mean, and that goes to credit. I mean, this is the biggest depth. Sixers roster we've had him forever. I mean, I couldn't tell you last time we could go this deep. And if, if you're not going to be playing thigh ball in, in games, I mean, that shows you how deep this team can go. And you're looking at the obvious Embiid, Simmons, Harris as the lock, the three starters, and then Curry yeah. Green. 
you'd expect. Um, so there's your five right there. And then, yeah, you talked about it. you got Shake Milton. You're going to have Dwight Howard come off the bench. You're going to have uh, Maxie. You're going to have um, – I, I mean, the way they rotated him in, in preseason, I think Mike Scott has a slate edge over him. So you're already looking at 10 guys right there. Now you're getting a thigh ball about 10, 11 in the rotation. So, yeah. I mean, listen, it's unfortunate because... You, you also know how much... throw Furk in if they still like playing oh, Furk. I, so. I forgot Furk on. Yeah, no, he, I mean, Doc Rivers talks about him unbelievable, like, all the time. And you saw it in preseason. Furk Khan was one of the first few people off the bench, so he's going to get time. And, and I think Thibault, I think his spot right now, and nothing against him, because, again, it gets, goes to show you how deep this team can go. I think Thibault is more, he's gonna, just going to be more of a defensive guy at this point. Uh, until further notice, pending injuries or anything. Yeah, I think it's pretty much what you said. It's just how this team lays out now. There's no, and I know, I think it was Danny that said this on the Sixers talk, but one of them said it, um, that he just has kind of fallen into a place where he doesn't bring anything they don't have in the top, like, eight on their roster already that you mentioned, where everyone else has the scoring ability with, defense they might not have the defense ability of him but because they have more ability in the offensive end proven already they're going to get more playing time so it's kind of he just fell into a hole of where he just doesn't have anything above and beyond that's going to give him playing time over these other guys we already have in-house it kind of already is this thing with this guy we got in the second round, Isaiah Joe, is actually a pretty good player that will probably get more playing time later in the season on other clubs. On the Sixers, he probably won't play at all if all goes well as a rookie because there shouldn't be a reason if all goes well for Isaiah Joe, unless if he's absolutely demolishing yeah. the league, to have to play in the regular season. The only way you would play him is if he's absolutely torching everybody in the G League and he forces your hand. Yeah, you that's, a, that's a guy you're going to have to either give a two-way contract to or just keep him in the G League because I think that's what's going to suit him best, and you need to give him playing time. He needs to develop. I mean, he, he's yeah, got skill. You can't just sit there either. Yeah. That's he, the he's, big got, thing. he's got skill, and he has potential. And, I mean, you, you remember, I'm sure you remember as much as I do, we were talking about possibly drafting Isaiah Joe first round. I mean, that's where they viewed him as. I mean, they're really high on him. Um, obviously, that didn't happen. And then you trade a couple early second rounders, and all of a sudden he falls into mid second round. And, and hopefully, you get a steal in that pick. And But I think his guy has to continue to play. You can't have him just eat up spots on the uh, bench and minutes and not let him uh, continue that. Because, again, with the shooter, he is. I mean, obviously, I'm not wishing it, but say someone does get hurt, you can't just have him sit through half the season and not getting any action and then throw him into the mix. So I'd rather have him playing in the G League and tell him, like, this isn't nothing against your playing skills. We just need you to keep shooting. That way if something happens and we need you to uh, catch fire fast, like, you can come out right away and join the club. Well, they already have a proven guy on their roster that they can point to when they pitch that um possibility to Isaiah Joe, which is Milton, because they brought Milton along as a second round pick. They let him play a while in the G League. And now you see that that probably actually is panning out, taking it slow and having that take it slow approach. So they have a guy to point to when they uh, they give that approach to somebody. But yeah, I do agree with everything you said there. So now I think it's a good time than ever to move on to some of the good acquisitions we made in this offseason. We brought in a Curry, obviously not Steph Curry, but a Seth Curry in a very good shooter himself. And Danny Green, who uh, two years ago was still a big part of a run deep into the playoffs. Last year, of course, yeah, he did have a little bit of a falling off. But still definitely has shown in the preseason he can still mean some business on a basketball court. So what do you think of those two acquisitions at guard we'll start with, um, bringing them in this offseason? Yeah, I think it's pretty big fit-wise and obviously spacing the floor-wise. It's going to come down to uh, – it's going to come down tremendously. And you already know Simmons, I believe – uh, was the best in the league with assists on three pointers, and now you bring in two guys that were already a lot better than anything we had last year shooting wise, and you're only going to add to that. So I think that goes to show how big it is. And then on top of that, one thing that impressed me at least in preseason was 
Danny Green's defensive ability still. And I knew he wasn't a bad defender, but like you said, he kind of took a step back last year, it seemed like, and, and his ability on the defensive end through, and I get it, it's just preseason, but if he can carry that into the, in the season, that his ability defensively was honestly more surprising to me and had me more excited than his actual shooting ability, which is obviously his main thing, um, just because how much it surprised me to that degree. And um, Seth Curry, obviously, what, shot 44%, I think, from th- three last year. So that yeah. goes into, yeah, into really what, good. without saying, and I think, uh, yeah, I, I think it's going to be a better fit, not necessarily a better roster and better players on the team, but a better fit, which can go a long way for this team uh, through the season. Yeah, yeah, I think it all falls into place more because you allow Tobias Harris with this type of lineup to be the more overall scorer, which is actually his play style than just yes. sitting at the three-point line, uh, which is not. So that that's also why I think it helps as well because it allows your other star to kind of fall into his role rather than having to be forced to do things with the old team that really were probably out of his realm of comfortability uh, at certain times. Um, So that's what I think. Yeah, that's what I think is big for these moves, too. Now, another big move we saw in the second preseason game is bringing in Dwight Howard because he actually now, it seems, when Joel is even going to be out for a game, just brings that hustle and that grit where we didn't have that backup center we had in recent years, except for like maybe the Amir Johnson won the hustle awards, but he did not bring the grit to the ability and defense to the ability at all of Dwight Howard. Uh, You actually have a backup center now, like a guy that you can count on, it seems to be a guy that can play 12, 13, 14 minutes if he has to a night. So what do you think that adds to a dimension of our roster? I think it's huge. I mean, you mentioned it previous years. One thing you lack is when Embiid leaves the floor and you get killed offensively and defensively just because he, he, you lack so much when he's not on the floor. And you've relied on guys like Amir Johnson, Kyle O'Quinn, um, Al Horford. We all saw that went last year. Um, I mean, I'm sure I'm forgetting some guys, some of those random centers you bring in. Yeah, we have um, so many. So, Didn't we bring in Okafor for a short period of time, and then we brought in Greg Monroe. Greg Monroe, <laughs> yeah. yes. Forgot about him. Here's the playoff. Yeah. Here's the playoff pickup. Um, so, yeah, again, but now you got a solidified backup center here, a guy with uh, not only experience in the league, championship experience, playoff experience, which can go a long way for these young guys, too. And that's another thing with Danny Green, I forgot to mention, is that experience he brings in. So I, I'm yeah, excited because, really like you said yesterday, or like you I don't know why I said yesterday. Like you said in the last preseason game, Dwight Howard that showed you how big of ability it is to still be able to be a uh, a, a team that can contend still without him being on the floor, uh, just because you get so much in Dwight Howard from all his offensive ability and defensive yeah. ability. So um, that was honestly my one of the sleeper but best pickups of the off season because you've lacked that so many times the last three or four years, and now you could finally say. Uh, if Embiid's on the floor, okay, we might be able to stay afloat uh, right here. Yeah, I agree. And I think, honestly, they made two decent pickups there because games Embiid doesn't play in before you had nobody to go to to begin with, and then you really had nobody to go to when that other person got subbed out. Where now you have Dwight Howard and a guy in Tony Bradley who's nothing special but also isn't a scrub. So you actually have somebody that's got five and five a game in the NBA, which is really decent stats if you're going to be a third string center for a team. So that's not bad to have either the depth there. Now you have at center, having him as your third stringer to be able to have him as your backup rather than just a random guy, like a Greg Monroe or an Okafor at this point of his career, when he was on the team as your backups that really have not much left to, Uh, give at this point where you got a 22 year old that maybe if you kind of fine tune some of his things can actually maybe become a decent backup center for you uh, when Dwight Howard moves on too since you brought in a young guy that maybe you can kind of figure out a little bit yeah I I mean I don't disagree I, I like Tony Bradley I'm not like huge fan of his I don't think he's much of an upgrade over like uh, what was it, Pele or Novell uh, Pele last year? Uh, I mean, I, I see them kind of similar guys. Um, I, I think Tony Bradley might offer you a little more on the offensive end, 
So, yeah, you upgrade that. Uh, but defensively, I don't think he brings much more than Pele. So I, it, it's going to be an interesting situation. But, yeah, I, I don't disagree with that. Yeah, it's just he actually has been in the NBA a bit compared to Appel, who hasn't really. We tried him out. He didn't show anything even to the ability of 5-5 five and five a game, potentially, at this point consistently. that that That's all uh, I was saying. I don't think he's anything special either. It's just to have – a depth there when you have them beat out is actually helpful yes. in my eyes. Um, another big thing we saw in this preseason is a guy speaking of someone that had a rough last year, Mike Scott actually looks like he's capable again. And seems like in this offense scheme, we're running with doc rivers. He actually blends in and fits in a lot better now again, like he did two years ago, just kind of being a guy that roams around and finds a way to get open and actually contributes that way. And then is scrappy on the other end, of course, I wouldn't call him the best defender. I would just say he's scrappy on the other end is probably the best way to to describe Mike Scott, which then leads to turnovers at times. So if he can keep playing like that, wouldn't you agree? Maybe he's back and actually able to be a good bench contributor again. Yeah, I don't know. Again, obviously, two preseason games is pretty early, but I don't know who to give credit to, whether it's Mike Scott or Doc Rivers or both. I mean, but it looks it looks like Rivers knows him well and can already find a fit for him. One and then two, it looks like Mike Scott put in work this off season because those two games we saw in preseason was better than anything we saw him do last year. Like in all honesty, oh, I'm not correct. trying to sound <laughs> sound rude or anything and, and rip on him, but like what we saw in those first two preseason games or what we saw that first year we traded for him and everyone like like found the hype around him and stuff so that was very encouraging to see and that's why i said he i think right now he's ahead of thigh in the rotation because of again whether it's the fit with rivers whether it's the, the work he put in the off season or, or both it's it was clearly there in the first two preseason season games and if, if you find him adding stuff as a ninth man in the rotation kind of things so this team can go a long way I mean, if you're sitting there like, okay, Mike Scott's actually giving us good stuff and everything, and you're nine, ten deep in that team, that that's what playoff teams got. So I'm excited for it and all for it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I think the Sixers really did hone in on uh, their depth. Would you need uh, facing teams in this Eastern Division you're facing as well? Because they talked about it uh, coming into the season. Everybody I listen to talks about how deep the Nets are. You're going to need when you play the Nets to be able to go eight deep, potentially nine deep to be able to stay up with their bench. Otherwise, you're going to have guys breathing and gasping for air out there as the second stringers of the Nets are out there demolishing everybody because everyone's about to fall flat on their face of exhaustion. So like that's um that's a big key for our division, I think, as well. Boston, when Kemba Walker comes back, without Kemba not as much, has pretty good – depth when Kemba's in the starting lineup at guard and then uh if Daniel Theis and Williams can continue to develop pretty decent down low as well so yeah I agree with you I think having this depth that they brought in this year it's not it's kind of goes back to what you said at the beginning you didn't bring in more household names like big money guys you just brought in guys that seem to fit into the puzzle better than the team kind of fit into each other exactly. last year that's really what it is but I think a couple wrap-up questions, of course, I have for you is, one is, in order for everything to go right for the Sixers this year, I don't mean like everything going right would be winning the finals, but in terms of everything going right in the regular season, what do you think has to happen? Who needs to continue to step up and what needs to fully come together for that such thing to happen? Uh, First, uh, to go easy, I'll, I'll stick with health. Um, obviously we've seen Simmons. I mean, whether you win this series or not, you don't get swept by the Celtics. If Ben Simmons is on the court in the playoffs, obviously we know Embiid's track record. Obviously we've seen other guys as well go down left and right and, and stuff. So I'd say the biggest thing is health. If you, this team stay healthy there, there's no limit in the East. Um, but actually on the court and being serious that way, listen, you're going to go as far as Simmons and Embiid take you. I, you know, and what people would say a down year for Tobias Harris, he still put up 19.6 points a game, still shot 47% from the field, still averaged six and six rebounds, and I think around four assists. So you know what you're going to get out of Harris. You know, again, you well, know. One thing get- on that, too, is 
the big thing I hit on, and this should be able to get people to shut up since I'm sometimes have been harder on Tobias Harris. So if I compliment him, that should hopefully work out in the end uh, for his mojo. Um, but he was playing out of his realm last year. He was asked to do some things that he hasn't been as comfortable doing overly shooting. He would rather score. He's a scorer. He's not just, he's not really a shooter. I would identify Tobias as that's why this team fits his mojo better, which I think is what people are going to see. He might average, be averaging the same amount of points this year, but it would be in a lot, it would just look a lot better to people because it would flow better. It wouldn't be shooting up as much shots that don't fit into his uh, criteria as much, I guess is a way to put it. Yeah, no, I see what you're saying. And I think, yeah, I don't know if you remember this, but that was one of our biggest ever sports debates, if I remember correctly, it was Tobias Harris that one night. Me and Joe kept going back and forth on it. Uh, so that was funny. Uh, but no, yeah, so I'd say, number one, uh, excluding health, um, you're going to go as far as Embiid and Simmons take you. And what I mean by that is you know what you're going to get out of them. But if Embiid's still, if Embiid's in better shape and he can give you more minutes, fine. But if he's still tired at the end of games, you're still going to see him chuck up those threes because he's not going down the post late in games. He's still not going to get back on defense as fast enough. Same thing with Simmons. You don't need him to shoot, but you need him to be aggressive. You need him to spread the floor well, and that's what you got in those guys. And then, again, I, I think you know what you're going to get out of Curry and Green. So I think the biggest thing, the third thing for this team is the depth. Because, listen, while I love the pieces we got and everything, let's not also forget, though, there's still some question marks with them. Like Shake Milton. Yes, we love the player he's turning into, but say he say he doesn't take that next step and he kind of is that second-round pick. You could be in trouble because he's going to be one of the first guys off the bench. Furcon, you know how much I love the guy, but if he's not consistent with that three off the bench, you're not going to have that shooting ability. Dwight Howard? Yes, we love his fit right now and everything, but we do know his question marks on and off the court yeah. at sometimes. So we still need that to fi- to figure out. So yes, I, and I don't. I'm just saying like that's that's what I'm talking about when you, I say you need the depth to click too. Is yes, we know what we can be now. Is it actually going to be that? Is the real question. And we just talked about it. Mike Scott had an off year last year, but he looks better this year. Thibault, can he produce offensively? We all know he's can be one of the best defenders off the bench, but what is his offensive game going to look like? Um, so I'll, I do love all these fits and everything is set up to be really nice shooting wise, spread the floor wise, and everyone can fit, fit, fit. Now how, the question is, how do they play out? And that's the thing. I was a Brett Brown guy, but Doc Rivers is obviously a better coach than Brett Brown. And that's what I think we're really going to see a difference is, and maybe you can add this as my fourth point if, if you want, but would be Doc Rivers. And how does he gel this team together in a odd COVID year where you didn't get preseason, you didn't get camp like you usually do. You got what? I think it was, I guess now, 20 seconds. So it was like maybe 15 days of camp, and then he had those two preseason games and then practices. So I think that's going to be a lot of things, and I think it can work. And um, I think it'll gel pretty nicely when it's all said and done. Yeah, I think it's also funny how when Brett Brown and other people complimented Fur, kind of was like, "Ah, oh, just shut up." Uh, just... Where now that Doc Rivers comes in, everyone's like, "Ah, oh, this dude. Oh, yeah, right? I just like Furcon Corkmans. Oh, this guy. Well, I can't just Brett Brown's word. It's Brett Brown. Guy, uh, Doc Rivers likes him, so you know what? I'm yeah. all on board with him. <laughs> but that's just one of the things I find funny from just listening to the radio somewhere now as you hear some people when they talk about depth they mention Ferk's name where that never right. happened before. <laughs> um so but yeah it's nice to have this depth you're exactly right though in order for everything to fall into place everyone needs to actually play and perform at, to the their abilities <clears throat> Phillies. um so that's, that's, another day. <laughs> that's um that's really the key to success in any league so I do think the Sixers are going to be able to do that, though. Um, so before uh, I say as our closing thoughts what my prediction would be for how good they're able to do this year, since you gave all your uh, four points there, how far do you think this team's going to be able to go this year from the start of the season outlook? Because then we'll do another podcast midseason, I guess, and then end of season and see if we're right or wrong. Um, and ha- so like seeding and prediction for how far we can go. Yeah, I think, uh, in all honesty, um, before I give my final prediction, I think the ceiling for this team is is the conference, or is the NBA Finals. I think the East is wide open. Um, 
I think you can sit here and say this team, that team, and this team can finish one through four. But in reality, I think I could see, I mean, really, I could see the Sixers beating the Bucks in a series. I could see the Bucks beating the Sixers. I could see the Sixers beating the Celtics. I could see them beating the Sixers. Uh, same thing with the Raptors and the Nets. I mean, there, there's a lot of teams in this conference that I could sit here and say, okay, I could see them beating being up on each one, one, one another and everything, whether it's, okay, the Sixers eliminate the Nets in the first round as a 4-5 or five matchup, and then the Bucks eliminate the Sixers in the next round, something like that, if you understand what I'm saying. No, I get you. Yeah. I would say, personally, I think I see the Sixers finishing about the three seed or four seed. So I'll be optimistic on here. I'll say a three seed um, behind the Bucks, and I think, uh, I think you'd probably have the Nets finish just ahead of us. Um, assuming Durant stays healthy and everything, but um, after that, I, I think uh, Sixers. I think Sixers are going to be right there. The Raptors, uh, Celtics, and Pacers. I, I really think all those teams are pretty good and can do. Atlanta damage. got a lot better. Yeah, Atlanta yeah. too. So um, seating's going to be interesting in the East this year, that's for sure. But if right now I had a pick, I think I'd go Bucks, Nets, at Sixers. Gotcha. Um... Yeah, the real right around where I'm at, I had them at about a four um, is what I had us at. Because I just think the Nets honestly have a chance if KD stays healthy to be the best team in the East above Milwaukee. And then Milwaukee yeah. would drop down to the two. Uh, and then there. um three could either be, I think Toronto will might drop out of being that contested. I think Boston would probably be three if Kemba's able to come back quick enough and then we would be four yeah i think my my thing on toronto is i think van vliet he he's a fantastic player but i think he did excel last year so i don't think he's gonna be like a bad player i'm not saying that but i think it takes a little bit of a step back for toronto so that's why i think they'll lose some in that sense kyle lowry's a year older i think he's maybe 35 36 now so yeah yeah he's not getting any younger but that's why i think boston will probably be the third team there with it being Nets, Bucks, Boston, then us uh, at four would be the way that I would be looking at that coming in. I do think, though, even as a four seed, that's just because I think the East is going to be so close, like you said. The Sixers still have a good chance to make it to at least the Eastern Conference Finals, if not the Finals, where that's really going to come down to who gets eliminated and who we have to go up against and match up against in the Eastern Conference Finals, because I think we match up better probably against a team going up against Boston again than I think we do against Brooklyn. So it, it yeah. kind of depends who we match up against in those Eastern Conference Finals in my eyes. Exactly. That's what's all going to come down to is matchups and everything. Just like in the March Madness, some teams play other teams better and, and just fit, like you said, matchup-wise. So when it's all said and done, that's what's going to come down to. And obviously health. I mean, any given year, someone gets hurt, unfortunately, and changes the whole outlook of it. So. But, yeah, uh, we're right around the same page. Yeah, you had them third going to the finals um, is your thing, and I had them at least Eastern Conference finals likely being able to get to the finals if they have a good matchup. So, yeah, pretty much along the same line. So that has been our NBA season preview for our Philadelphia 76ers. I hope you all enjoyed the content. Please like, comment, and subscribe. And also follow Andrew on Twitter at AJ underscore Santangelo and me on Twitter at JJ Boric 26 For Joe Boric and Andrew Santangelo, this has been Sports Fanatic News Sixers Preview. Peace out, everybody.